A monopoly is both alluring and 100% immoral. When you are the only person who can sell a certain thing that people need or want, a monopoly means no competition. So you can charge whatever you want. You can be as shitty and unresponsive to customer service issues, and most importantly, your product can be as shittily made as you desire because no one else can legally sell it. It seems like the United States government, or any government for that matter, would not want anyone to have a monopoly on anything. But there is one way to have a protected and legal monopoly on an idea, and it's called a patent. Tucson Studios in Arizona. This is the One Minute History Podcast. Here's your host, the hardest working man on the internet, Casanaya. Imagine a world with sharp edges on every electronic device. A world where you had to ask permission and pay a heavy fee if you wanted to take a picture or film a video. A world where you had the choice of only, say, 50 podcasts. A world where chicken nuggets are only sold to McDonald's. A world where you couldn't play mini-games during video game loading screens. These are just a few examples of how people could have used patents as legal monopolies. And some of them, you might recognize, were legal monopolies. Some of them were successful for a time in stifling any creative innovation or progress. Progress is the number one enemy of patent monopolies and licensing fees. If someone clever comes along and improves upon your idea or figures out your formula and makes it cheaper or better, that idea that you have a stranglehold on turns from a solid into a vapor, a gas that leaks through your fingers, it is inevitable that people will try to expand upon good ideas. So here it is, the top 10 patent trolls. Number 10, Henry Talbot thinks he owns photography. In 1835, Henry Talbot was the British inventor of the Talbot type the first chemical film process that created negatives, given the ability to create many high-quality copies, not just the original. It was a true innovation. Talbot used his patent as a monopoly in England, and only artists he chose and who paid him a hefty royalty, according to him, were the only ones who could use photography. When there were artists wishing to use this new form of art, Talbot used his licensing power to utterly stifle scientific and artistic progress in England and its possessions. Talbot stopped inventing and declared any further scientific development in photography that he had no connection to to also fall under his wide interpretation of his patent. He began to sue everyone and applied for a patent extension. He didn't get the extension, and further developments quickly overtook Talbot type, making it irrelevant. Talbot thought he owned photography and was widely criticized for it. Number 9. Candy Crush Thinks They Own the Word Saga King.com had produced several small games using the word saga at the end of each of the titles. In 2011, they received a trademark for their games. They objected to another company called Stoic, calling their game the Banner Saga. King.com, because they had a very popular game called Candy Crush Saga, basically thought they owned the word saga when used in the title of a game. They're still acting as patent trolls, filing objections to the title of the game Arcane Saga and another game called Candy Pang. Yes, the assholes at King.com think they own the word candy. King.com has not sued anyone, but they have gotten Apple to remove games they thought were too close to their title. 
and they use trademark objections to bully other companies that use words. The apologists I have seen for King.com's behavior say that developers need distinct marks that no consumer would confuse with another app. Of course, this is total bullshit, as having a different name but still using words in the English language is a distinct mark. No one thinks they are walking into a pizza hut when they walk into a pizza inn or a pizza corner or a pizza uno or a pizza 73 or a pizza fusion or a pizza ranch or a pizza barn or a pizza studio or a pizza table. Do you get the point, Candy Crush Pizza? Number eight, Azure Software thinks they own JPEGs. JPEGs are the most popular form of digital pictures on the internet. Back in 2002, this company decided it owned the JPEG compression standard because of a patent it held. This is many, many years after JPEGs had been established as a free compression. There was ample evidence of what is known as prior art as well. Prior art is a legal term in patent disputes that disallow assholes from claiming what is clearly ideas in the public domain. Basically, if some asshole comes along and says they own the color blue because the patent office was stupid enough to issue a patent for it, then the moment they sue or try to license the color blue, you can point to a fucking sky and say, prior art, asshole, the whole thing will be dismissed. Despite a completely frivolous connection, and many years that had passed before the patent troll decided to start suing people, they still prevailed in extorting money. Ninety million dollars in royalties have been paid by 30 companies, according to this patent troll. Number seven, a company called Personal Audio thinks they own podcasts. A lot has been written about this particular patent troll. The company itself basically exists to protect and sue over its patents. And that's it. There's a pretty great story called When Patents Attack by the show This American Life uh, from NPR. It's all about famous podcasters who've been sent cease and desist letters from this company unless they pay a hefty license fee. Adam Carolla also made his countersuit against this patent troll as a favorite topic on his podcast. And there's no better time to listen to Adam Carolla than when he's complaining. Their patent was listed as an audio program and message distribution system in which a host system organizes and transmit program segments to client subscriber locations. The supreme vagueness of this description gives you a sense of how shitty the patent office in the United States is at issuing real patents. They basically hand them out and let the court decide later in multi-million dollar lawsuits that the claim is unoriginal bullshit. But in the meantime, these patent trolls get to go around and extort money. And just like other patent trolls on this list, this company still somehow made $8 million in a lawsuit against Apple in 2009. In 2015, a successful challenge by the Electronic Frontier Foundation revoked several provisions of the podcast-related patent, and they haven't sued since. Number six, Yahoo thinks they own personal customization. In 2012, Yahoo settled a patent lawsuit they filed against Facebook. Yahoo was the fading internet player while Facebook was a rising giant, and Yahoo basically thought they could extort a deal for Facebook stock, just like they had done years earlier with Google. See, in 2002, Yahoo sued Google over AdWords because it had a similar idea called Overture that they bought the patent from. Logic would dictate that a company wouldn't be able to patent an idea of advertising on the web, but Google settled out of court for 2.7 million shares of common stock 
in Google. So right before Facebook was going to launch their own IPO, Yahoo pulled the same shenanigans, doubtedly in an attempt to extort some sweet-ass stocks from the company. They claimed 10 different patent infringements. The patents claimed they owned the ideas of personalizing ads to the user, monitoring ads for click fraud, selecting privacy settings for personal information, and customizing a web experience. If this shit sounds fucking vague, that's because it is. Luckily, Yahoo didn't succeed in getting any stock, and the only outcome of this case was to have Yahoo and Facebook integrate more and establish that the two companies could not sue each other over patents ever again. Number five, the Wright brothers think they own flight. The Wright brothers are hero inventors who invented airplanes. We have forgotten their despicable fight against any other innovators in flight because we consider them heroes. In 1917, the Wright brothers, along with the Curtis Company, held two major patents that effectively blocked the building of any new airplanes. It took the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, to pressure them into accepting what is now known as a patent pool. Planes were desperately needed for World War I. The patent trolls were forced to accept a blanket license fee, use of all patents related to flight. Glenn Curtis was one of the people sued by the Wright brothers in 1908. He was so frustrated by the fathers of aviation that they had turned into such trolls that his lawyers said that if someone jumped in the air and waved his arms, the Wrights would sue for it. Number four, Western Union thinks they own telephones. Now, it just happened in history that Alexander Graham Bell received a patent for the telephone before Elijah Gray. Bell had applied for improvement to telegraphy mere hours before Alicia Gray filed for his patent in the art of transmitting vocal sounds or conversations telegraphically through an electric circuit. Based on those few hours. Bell was granted the patent for the telephone, but Gray, along with the company Western Union, would file 600 lawsuits challenging the patent. The lawsuits were decided in Bell's favor, not because of the few hours of difference, but because Bell established the technology that would make it possible, variable resistance. Ironically, Western Union was offered the patent for telephones by Bell in 1876 for $100,000. Western Union rejected the offer because they thought the telephone was a useless technology, and they were happy with the telegraph. A year later, they regretted it and began trying to corner the now budding telecommunications business. In 1879, Bell Telephone won rights to Western Union Telephone-related patents and tens of thousands of Western Union phones and subscribers. In return, Western Union received 20% of Bell rentals for the remainder of the patent life. Because of this, Bell Systems had become the ultimate patent troll. They controlled a monopoly over telephones until they were forced to break up in 1984 in the biggest antitrust case in U.S. history. The breakup resulted in seven independent companies. They would later form into what is now major parts of AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, CenturyLink, and Quest. Number three, Amazon thinks they own pictures with blank backgrounds. Yes, Amazon actually got a patent for pictures with white backgrounds. This may seem like something that's incredibly intuitive, and all kinds of prior art can be pointed to. But fuck it, they're a big company. Just look at this brilliant chart and marvel at the idea that no one before it could have ever done anything like this ever, ever, ever. Number two, Apple Computer thinks they own rounded edges. This is number two on the list for the simple reason that the patent troll Apple successfully sued Samsung in the largest patent lawsuit in history, and they won. In 2011, the jury awarded Apple 
one billion dollars in a patent infringement lawsuit over rounded edges. Yes, one billion dollars for basically saying they own devices that have rounded edges. Fucking rounded edges. More specifically, a rectangle with rounded edges. So take this Cheez-It box for example. As you can see here, this Cheez-It box is a rectangle. It now has rounded edges. So Apple owns this Cheez-It box. Samsung eventually agreed to pay $548 million to Apple five years later, with the caveat that they will continue to sue to get their money back. And the number one patent troll... Thomas Edison thinks he owns motion pictures. In 1891, Thomas Edison filed a patent for the kinetoscope. It was the first motion picture machine. Then he established the Edison Trust to act as a patent monopoly over all Nickelodeons. Nickelodeons were the first theaters. They'd charge a nickel for you to go in and watch a movie. Thomas Edison, the Wizard of Menlo Park, for a time was the only person producing films, and he was just raking it in. Everyone wanted to see this new thing called motion pictures. But the films he made sucked. And also, later Edison saw the George Millier's masterpiece, A Trip to the Moon. We've all seen it. It's, it's the movie with the space capsule stuck into the eye of the moon, and the, the moon has a face on it. You know that one? Yeah. Edison saw it in England, saw that it was doing really well in London. He then bribed a theater owner for a copy, brought it back to America, made a whole bunch of copies, and then distributed it all over the United States, making a bunch of money for himself, doing the actual definition of piracy. Edison was a total shithead. So then, Carl Lemley in Chicago sees that the Edison Trust really sucks. Rules like films could not charge different prices no matter how inexpensive or cheap a film was pretty much ensured that films had no incentive to be good. They also couldn't include credits because that might make celebrities out of film stars. And if that happened, then they might deserve to be paid better. So seeing that Edison Trust films are garbage, Carl Lemley makes his own and they don't suck. Edison sued anyone who would dare make a film not under his stringent rules because that is what the patent trolls do. Oh, and by the way, Edison stole the technology for motion pictures from Edward Mybridge, who demonstrated it at Menlo Park. Because Edison, again, is a total shithead. Edison sued Lemley 289 times. Edison hired thugs to beat up people who watched Lemley Films. These hired goons invaded productions and destroyed film equipment. Lemley's independent motion picture company fought back. They created the first movie star, Florence Lawrence. Yes, that's her nightmare of a name. It was a silent movie era back then. Nobody had to actually say her name out loud for her to be a movie star. Lemley moved his production company to an orange grove in Los Angeles to get away from Menlo Park thugs and changed the name to Universal Studios. Universal Studios is still the oldest film company in the world. Adolf Zucker, a New York Nickelodeon owner, wanted to show full-length films and paid a bunch of money to distribute the French film Queen Elizabeth. When the Edison Trust denied his license to show it because Sandra Bernhardt was considered too big a celebrity and the runtime of 40 minutes was too long for the dumb American public, according to the Edison Trust, Zucker had had enough. He premiered the Queen Elizabeth anyway, and it was a huge hit. He also moved to the same Orange Grove in California, forming Paramount Pictures. Lemley and Zucker were helped by a rebellious theater owner, William Fox, who used his theaters to show non-Edison films under the company name 20th Century Fox. Of course, that orange grove in California is known as Hollywood. The United States government sued Edison in an antitrust case and he lost summarily in the Supreme Court. The Edison Trust was broken and now art could expand 
freely. This top 10 list does not include the Fine Brothers of YouTube. They may think they own reaction videos, but they didn't make any money off of it. They never went through with trying to trademark the name React. The Fine Brothers were arrogant. They were stupid. They were power hungry and short sighted. But this happens throughout history. And when they received a massive backlash, they realized their mistake and now admit what a foolish idea it was to think that they own a whole genre of YouTube videos. The Fine Brothers deserved the backlash that they got. But unlike many patent trolls, they didn't dig in their heels and insist on their advantageous yet completely immoral protectionism. One Minute History with Cass and I on YouTube and the podcast has a copycat. On YouTube, someone has started a channel also called One Minute History, but not the digit one. It's spelled out one. Now, they did this a year after I started making videos called One Minute History, and six months after I started making videos on the channel One Minute History. Now, there's nothing I can do about it, and I, I don't own the patent on tiny historical documentaries or documentaries or YouTube videos. That's what the whole point of this conversation of patent trolls was about. Even though this idea seems to have been stolen outright, while One Minute History, my One Minute History, the real One Minute History that you are listening to remains a small channel, we will be very vulnerable are in danger of being swallowed up by what seems like a production company that can afford to hire voiceover talent and editors to make videos that look an awful lot like mine. So you have to share One Minute History with your friends. Post episodes and, and, and talk about it with others. And you can support us for free on Patreon. For everyone who supported One Minute History, we thank you. Next time on One Minute History, we're going to talk about Fidel Castro. For One Minute History, my name is Casanaya. Good night, and have a pleasant tomorrow.